You know, this morning I'm thankful for a number of matters as we gather together. First of all, um, I am thankful for uh, the love and the support that's been extended to uh, me, uh, my wife Susan, our children uh, during this time. Uh, most, if all of you don't know, I've been diagnosed with kidney cancer and there's a surgery coming up this Friday. And uh, so we're asking, we're thankful for your continued prayers and and the expression we're using is one and done. That uh, they get in there, take that puppy out, it's all contained and uh, nothing else needs to be done. But uh, so we'd ask you to be praying towards that end and, and again, uh, so thankful for the, and, and it's overwhelming, the support and the love and the well wishes. It's, oh, Susan and I, we love you. And so thank you for loving us. Uh, and I'm thankful to the Lord uh, for you. But also I'm thankful because, uh, secondly, last Saturday, I had the opportunity to gather with uh, a group of other churches, and we're part of an association called Converge, and our local region is called Converge Great Lakes, and so it was our annual meeting where all the churches in Converge Great Lakes gather together, and there's about 120 or so, and and at this uh, particular annual meeting, uh, we were presented, uh, that is, Community Church was presented with a plaque. Now, frankly, anytime you know, you see somebody getting a plaque, it's usually a handshake and say, good job, you know, and then it goes and collects dust someplace. And it, it's usually a testimony to things that have happened in the past, and people kind of move on past it. But uh, this is when it was given it's not the best picture in the world, and really we do like each other. It looks like we're standing far apart. We're actually a lot closer than, than what this picture conveys, but that's uh, President Scott Rideout uh, who's speaking. He's the president of Converge, which is uh, over a thousand churches here in the United States and globally. Um, and then to the right uh, is Ken Nabby. He's our regional president. And uh, they presented this plaque that marked the fact that in the mid-80s, a couple, the Johnsons, moved to Oshkosh and they planted a church. In addition to uh, Steve Johnson's brother, Paul, uh, between the two of them, here in Wisconsin, and at the time I was in Pennsylvania, and we heard about these Johnson brothers in Wisconsin that were planting churches all through Wisconsin. It was going nuts. Well, what you may not be aware that since that time, literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches, if not thousands of churches, have been planted as a result of community church and being a part of those churches that started back in the 1980s. So in recognition of that, we got this plaque in appreciation to Community Church Oshkosh for being used by God to lay the foundation that led for a great wave of church planting across Converge. And it's signed by Scott Rideout and Ken Nabby. Now, um, it really did result in a great wave. As a result of not just churches being planted, but other denominations and associations picked up the model that was being used so that they could in turn plant churches. And you know what happens when a church is started? More people hear the good news about Jesus Christ. And so as a result of, of what the Lord started here, in, you know, 30 plus years ago, thousands upon thousands have been impacted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, yeah. So, let that sink in for a moment. That you just thought you were coming to church this morning. But you're part of a movement by God to impact literally the globe. And, uh, you know, so when I looked at that plaque and, and I heard what Scott Rideout was sharing his heart, and, and it just occurred to me that this... Sure, we could look at it as a tombstone to events in the past. Or 
It can be a signpost that motivates us to the future. To say, we want to be where God wants us to be in terms of reaching people for him, seeing his kingdom built up as we grow together in love with one another and with him and see lives change for the glory of God and the advancement of the kingdom. And so this is a rather long thank you because your participation by getting connected, being involved in community groups or helping out with a CSM or Hero Central or, or just in your workplace organizing Bible studies and prayer times and trying to connect people together because of your connection, we can look forward to what God will continue to do. Because of your giving, and some of you give sacrificially and over and above, and this is a challenge for all of us, that if you haven't seriously considered what God is calling you to give financially, to give, because this results in more and more churches being planted and more and more people hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I thank you for those faithful in their giving, thankful for their connecting, thankful for the way that we're reaching out. We have that partnership together. And, and so I'd like to pray again and just say thank you, Lord, for what you're doing and what you're going to continue to do. And may we put ourselves in the spot of having hearts that are soft, eyes that are open, ears that are listening, and hands and feet that are responsive to what God calls us to do. Okay? Can we pray that way? Can you pray with me? Well, let's pray then. Father, we do pray that your spirit will be at work in our hearts and our minds, opening our eyes up to see what you're calling us to do, to see the possibilities, to see the open opportunities that are all around us. Oh, God, we worship you for the work that you've done, and we're overwhelmed to consider, to think that, yes, even by coming in and connecting with one another, Literally, generations have been impacted. And so we do pray for eyes that are open, ears that are listening, a heart that is soft, and hands and feet that are ready to respond to what you call us to do. Lord, we want to glorify you in all things, in our partnership together, in our living life together. Oh God, be glorified, we pray this day. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, hey, if you need a Bible this morning, help our ushers out. They've been standing back there patiently holding. Put your hand up. They'd love to get one to you as we continue to engage uh, with God's Word. And we're going to be jumping back into uh, 1 Corinthians. And this letter that Paul wrote to a church that is highly dynamic, highly energetic, but this church is also going through immense struggles of personalities and positioning, posturing. People are drawing lines in the sand and getting people to queue up behind them in terms of support and uh, to advance their cause, to advance their agenda. They're going through a rather difficult time and in a section where Paul is challenging them to look at themselves in a different way, to understand that they are a body that needs to be built up. They need to be in the bodybuilding business of encouraging and, uh, one another and not just being in it for themselves. Paul starts out, and he actually started this section back in chapter 12, verse 1, where he says, now concerning spiritual gift, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. I, I don't want you to miss out on God's activity, what he's doing in your midst. I don't want you to miss out or let pass by the opportunities that God has right in front of you to build up other people, starting with each other. I don't want you to be unaware that you are part of a body. And because you're part of a body, you need one another. You're not all going to be the same body part. But each part needs the other part. You need one another to build one another up. I don't want you to be aware but I want you to be fully informed so that I will show you a more excellent way. And so we're coming into what is one of the, next to the 23rd Psalm in the Lord's Prayer, one of the most well 
known passages of Scripture in the world starts with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, where Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Oh, when I was a child, I I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now when you read through this passage, maybe you hear the wedding music going and you see the flowers and the dresses and the tuxedos up front, And in short, because wedding is a celebration of love, this chapter, in so many ways, fits with that so very well. But really, that's not Paul's focus. Anytime I sit down with somebody and we're talking through their wedding ceremony and they say, we want to read 1 Corinthians 13, I say, no, hey, we don't want to keep it at the sentimental, fluffy level. We want to mine down deep. This This is great stuff. This isn't just sentimentality that we're reading here. Because you think about it, if if chapter 12 is about God working through his people to build up the church through spiritual gifts, and if chapter 14 is about spiritual gifts, chapter 13 is about... Did somebody say weddings? No! (laughs) No! I thought I heard somebody say weddings. But yeah, it's about spiritual. Paul's talking about how you live life together. How you, how you walk through life together as God's people. And sir, sure, this passage can be used for a wedding, but please make sure you dig in deep and understand what Paul is talking about, the love's necessity, uh, love's activity, and love's eternity. You know, that, those are the three thoughts that jumped out to me as I was thinking through this passage this week. And, and the first comes down to love's necessity. He did not want them to be ignorant. In those first three verses, he did not want them to, to walk around in the dark about this. He wanted to be very, very explicit that no miracle, no manifestation, no sacrifice amounted to anything if it was done apart from lo- uh, with love mixed in. You see that, right? As I read through it, you heard it, right? That if love was not in the mix, then what was happening was to no avail. And if you look at, you can trace through some of the things he talked about in chapter 12, some of those gifts that he referred to in chapter 12. For example, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I am allowed God clanging gong, a clanging cymbal. Now for, you know, for us, we read that and it's like, oh, okay, but for them, it, it hit home because Corinth, they had all these temples devoted to all these different gods 
And one of them was the god Bacchus, the grape god, the wine god, the party god. And part of his celebration in that temple was the clanging of cymbals and gongs and making lots of noise in the midst of the celebration, as they would call it. And Paul's saying, listen, if you don't have love, no matter what comes out of your mouth, it's going to be to no avail. It's not going to have any effect. It, it, you know, you might as well go down the street to that other temple down there. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter for eternity. It, it doesn't, doesn't have the force of God's work involved. That's the necessity of love. It defines God's people, not just our love for God, but love for the people that God came and died for and then rose again to redeem. I mean, Jesus declared it when he, when he spoke to his disciples. John 13, and, and, he, and it, this was so important, he stressed it in John 15, and, and you can find different iterations of it, different statements of it throughout the Gospels. But in John 15, or 13, he says this, a new commandment I give to you that you help me out. What's it say? Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And he says in the next verse, whoop, sorry, I thought there were two verses up there. But, there it is. Oh, by, okay, there it is. By this will all people know that you are my disciples, by the way that you one another, by the way you interact with one another, by the way you engage with one another, by the way you take the love that God poured out upon your life and you, you let it flow out to the person that's next to you. That's the necessity of love. Words are good, but action's better, and so Paul goes to love's activity. You know, it's interesting. He didn't give a specific definition. He didn't say love and describe it as a noun or verb or an adjective or anything like that. He didn't say love and, and break out a definition. Uh, he does not describe it as a noun. He doesn't describe it as an adjective that is emotional feelings or things like that. Now, there are other places in Scripture where I believe there are very definite descriptions of love in terms of the emotional effect, the emotional impact, and all these as a noun and as an adjective. But in these verses here, starting in verse 4 through that, that paragraph, there are 15 verbs in there that love is about doing. Uh, love is active. Oh, when he says love is patient, love is kind, love is patient, what, that word patient there means patient with people. Uh, cutting them some slack. Extending grace. You know that situation where Maybe somebody's rubbing up against you raw and you're feeling it and you're like, Argh. but then you hear about why maybe they're acting the way they are. And, and so being patient is extending grace and being understanding, whereas kind is when there's anger present, seeking to be a calming influence and a positive influence in a, in a very real way, being a conscious peacemaker in the moment. So when he says love is patient, love is kind, it's, it's talking about giving people grace, pouring out grace, and being oil upon the waters and being that peacemaker in the midst of difficult situations. God loved us in action, so Paul says we are to love others in our action because love lasts eterni for eternity. Love's eternal. Love is so foundational that if you go from verse 8 through the end, love is the only thing left standing. You see that there. The gifts will pass, all these things will pass, but love does not. And so the call Paul gives here in verse 11 is grow up. Don't be so easily offended. 
Don't be so about self-promotion. Don't be so about your agenda that you're pushing it on top of other people. Grow up. Take the love that God has poured out in your life and let it flow to the people around you. You know, around here we like to say, I love my church. It's not like it's Alan's church or Bob's church or Sally's church or Sarah's church, but it's, it's our church, and, and it's my church because this is my family. And so we say, I love my church. Oh, and I would hope that we would never say that because we enjoy a special program that's going on or that we feel lifted up by a worship service and so, wow, I love my church because I always feel uh, juiced up, jazzed up when, when we leave. I feel so encouraged and ready for the week to come. Or that sense of accomplishment that we can have when we're reaching out to people in Haiti or people on High Street. But that when we say we love our church, we're talking about loving the person who's sitting next to us. Okay? This is what Paul's talking about here. I had a friend of mine, and um, Bruce, who was a, a significant mentor in my life, and he told me this story where he was at a place, he was working at this place, and there was another guy who loved Jesus in his office. You know, he, they, they were both claimed to be followers of Jesus. But the thing was, this guy got under Bruce's skin. Drove Bruce nuts. And just, you know, you know those people? You know, they're, they're always like, hey, can I borrow this? And you don't ever see it again. All right? That, that person who says, hey, I got I to gotta leave early. Can you cover for me uh, again? Uh, you know, I, I don't know what might get under your craw, but whatever this man was doing, it was getting under Bruce's, and he was just like, oh, man, oh, boy, this, this guy's driving me nuts. But you know, I, I got to love him because <sighs> he's a brother in Jesus. I got to love him. I'm going to love him. I can't love him. And so he got word that he was transfer to another department to which he just said, thank you. So he was in this new department for a couple months, things clicking along, feeling good about life, and all of a sudden, hey, Bruce, guess what? I've been transferred, and they're putting my desk right next to yours. And Bruce is just like, no, I can't believe this. And, and he would go day in and day out. And, you know, he'd punch in in the morning and just like dreading the day and he'd punch out at night saying, oh, some respite from this guy and, but it's coming again just tomorrow morning and just the cycle kept going and going and going and going. And one day, Bruce said, Lord, I've been trying to love this guy really, really hard, and it, it isn't working. I, I don't want you to, I, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. God, I, I guess I just have to ask it, you love him through me. And all of a sudden, Bruce testifies to this day. It was like a switch went off, or on, I should say. Because he recognized that this wasn't about mustering up feelings inside himself that probably weren't there. This wasn't about trying to, um, you know, in his own strength, accomplish something that, that was just chafing on the inside. He goes, wait a minute, God, when I'm asking you to love him through me, uh, I'm saying I need to be loved by you. And so help me to understand that love. And if I'm just a, if I'm just a, 
a vessel. It's not about me. It's, it's about what you're doing through me. And Bruce said that was a life-defining moment because as he surrendered the matter over to God, elements of pride, elements maybe of bitterness, of resentment, were broken. And he said, God, it's got to be you doing it through me. I just want you to think about the interactions that you've had this week. And think about, you know, as we read through 1 Corinthians 13, we know it so well in so many respects because we hear it at so many weddings. But this is the call that God has on each and every one of his people, on his sons and on his daughters, that they would be people that are reflecting not something that they muster up inside themselves, but, must, but, but they're just simply reflecting what God has been doing in their own hearts and lives. So here's a challenge, and it is a challenge. Um, I'm going to ask you about the interactions that you've had this week. And was there that person or those people that just rubbed you the wrong way? They got under your skin or whatever. They're a brother or sister in Christ. Get to, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to love them. Are you tired of doing it in your own strength? Or are you ready today to say, Lord, I can't. I can't. But I'm going to ask you Oh God, the God who loves me, to love that person through me. And so you're going to find a, a very practical reminder on your, on your seat, those cards, that says, the greatest of these is, and I'm going to ask you to carry this around, and I'm going to ask you to do something else. You know, stick it in your Bible, right there, 1 Corinthians 13, and every day this week, make it a commitment to pray through 1 Corinthians 13. To go through 1 Corinthians 13 and be thinking about the people that you engage with and see the possibilities that exist when you allow God to love someone through you. And there is nothing more powerful than the Word of God to address those hard places, to address those, those, those dark spots that we all have. There's nothing like the Word of God repeatedly hammering at that hard spot in our hearts until it breaks and we experience God's work instead of our work. So, that's my challenge for you this week, all right? Will you do it? 1 Corinthians 13, each and every day. And again, why this is so imperative, Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples by the way that you one another. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these words. In many ways, they're so um, poetic and they're so, well, they, they challenge the way we see things. They challenge the way we see the world around us. They challenge the way that we see the people around us. But Father, we pray that your spirit would take your word and apply it to our hearts, that your spirit would take your word and apply it to our lives that we would be able to love the people around us, not just in words or try to muster up some sentiment in our own hearts, but that we, in reflecting upon what you have done for us through Jesus Christ, would become that vessel by which your love can pour out upon those around us. Oh, Lord, our God, 
We want to be that people of love. Who love in action, not just in word. Who love in such a way that when people look at us, they would say, yes, God is at work in them. So lead us in this journey, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.